Okay. All right, our next press briefing is mapping the flow of ice around the globe. Our participants are Ted Scambos, Alex Gardner, Twy Lamoon, and Mark Fronstock. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, I'm Ted Scambos. I work at the National Snow and Ice Data Center at the University of Colorado. Uh, and you can see my colleagues' names and affiliations. They'll uh, say something about themselves before they begin to talk. Um, what we're going to talk about today is a data set and some of the early results from a data set that we've generated using both Landsat 8, which will be the main focus, and also earlier Landsat uh, satellites. What we're able to do now is track the motion of the world's ice from pole to pole and on every continent um, in detail and frequently so that we can really see all the changes that go on in ice on Earth in near real time. As you're probably aware, uh, ice on Earth is changing. Almost everywhere we look, we're seeing a response, a fairly dramatic response. In places where we know a little bit about the history, we're seeing greater responses in recent years than in the past. Glaciers are responding. They're a natural integrator of climate change because they respond over the course of years and also on shorter term uh, timescales to um, impacts on the environment that they're existing in. They interact with the ocean, they interact with the atmosphere, and so they're a, a critical bellwether for how Earth's climate is evolving. What we've been able to do is take Landsat pictures, pairs of Landsat pictures, and put them together and using a computer extract ice velocity measurements over all kinds of areas on Earth. This is a part of Antarctica that's about uh, 120 kilometers across the bottom. Uh, it's an area showing in warmer colors, very fast flow coming off of the Antarctic ice sheet. And in the cooler colors and in the blue colors, it actually maps, we're able to map, the very slow speeds in between these glaciers. And this entire image is an ice-covered image. And so we're actually, one of the additional advantages of Landsat 8 is that we're better able to see uh, the texture of the surface map almost completely the entire glacier from top to bottom or the entire ice sheet everywhere the satellite looks in great detail and very often. Uh, the repeat uh, cycle for Landsat 8 is 16 days as well as Landsat 7 and the Landsat a TM series in the 80s and 90s. And so every 16 days, we have the potential to get another image that we can compare to earlier images to map ice flow speed. So how do we do it? Basically, we take two small pieces of the two images, and using a computer, we look for the contrast features and match them up mathematically. It's called cross-correlation, but that's not too important. What we do is we find a peak match between these two grayscale patches. And using that peak in correlation, we've determined what the distance is that the ice has flowed relative to mountains or relative to other stationary features in the images. And we can map the ice flow speed knowing the difference in time between the two images. Now the main improvement with Landsat 8 is that not only are we able to map the glacier trunks where there are large crevasses and high contrast features, but also the surface of the ice sheet, even where it's smooth, down to these snow dune features. By being able to <coughs> track with higher uh, precision what the surface texture looks like, we can actually map the flowing skin of the ice sheet, even in areas that aren't crevassed or don't have big dunes or hills that are riding along on the surface. So here's a comparison between Landsat 7 and Landsat 8. On the uh, left-hand side, you see Landsat 7. You can tell that definitely we'd be able to track those uh, ridges over there. They're crevasses, actually, on the uh, moving part of the glacier. But that texture that you see on the left-hand picture is actually kind of noisy and changes almost every image. We can't track that. There's a finer texture that you see in Landsat 8 that's a better representation of what the surface rumples actually look like. Somewhat to our surprise, that actually stays put in areas that don't see a lot of snowfall for uh, two weeks, four weeks, even up to two or three months in areas um, that are fairly dry. And so we can actually track the flowing areas that are slow as well as fast. USGS has done a phenomenal job of managing the, the, the downstream part of the data set. NASA built a tremendous satellite that has the ability to track uh, all these glaciers in high resolution, high radiometric resolution, grayscale resolution. The USGS has done a great job of 
building up the ground system so that we get more images out of the satellite than we used to get. It's in the same orbit as Landsat 7 or Landsat 4 and 5, but we're actually able to run the satellite almost continuously over the daylit part of the Earth over land and get an image of all the glaciated areas on Earth as well as all the land areas on Earth and a good part of the ocean every single day. Every 16 days, it covers the entire globe with stripes that are separated uh, by a few hundred kilometers on each pass. So what we're able to do is get these individual pairs of images, produce a velocity map that you see on the left there, and then what my team is going to talk about here is how they've assembled these images and used them to analyze the evolution of several areas on Earth over time. This map shows the compilation of nearly 500,000 pairs that have been acquired since 2013. That's the beginning of the Landsat 8 era uh, through to almost the present. Uh, you get a nice map of Antarctica there. There's a lot of work that goes into that. There's also a lot of questions that we can address about how the ice sheet has changed, how the Arctic uh, glaciers have changed, how Greenland has changed, how high mountain Asia has changed. And those are the topics, those are the areas that uh, my colleagues here are going to talk about uh, for the next couple of minutes. Okay, um, my name is Alex Gardner. I, I work at uh, the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, which is part of uh, Caltech. Um, I'm going to follow on what Ted was talking about. Um, and, you know, he kind of gave a, a good kind of summary of, of why we're up here and w what the new capabilities are and kind of some of the, the things that we're able to do with that new data set. But the first thing I want to do is I, I just want to talk about kind of the broad scientific importance of why we're looking at these things. Um, why do we want to see if they're changing? Um, is it just scientific interest or is there also some societal importance here? Uh, then I'll, I'll kind of go back on to the uh, talk about the global mapping, why the global mapping as a static field is, is important and interesting. And then uh, look at how everything comes alive when we look at the time variable part. So, so repeat mapping over multiple years. So the underlying, the, the largest underlying uh, um, issue that we're trying to address is sea level rise. So over the last several decades, sea level has been rising at about three millimeters per year. And that's largely due to two things, uh, thermal expansion of the ocean, warmer ocean, less dense, bigger volume, so the ocean rises. But primarily it's been rising because more ice has been leaving land and going into the ocean, which is causing the water level to rise. Now over the last 30 years, we know that that's been occurring and we've been able to monitor it, but what we're really after now is, is how do we anticipate that the ice will change into the future and that ultimately drives what the future sea level will be. And this, this has scientific importance. Uh, this is a fundamental part of the Earth system that's been operating since the dawn of time. And uh, it has a large societal impact because we have uh, a lot of uh, communities near the coast and um, there are engineers that are now looking to develop the uh, cities for the decades to come and they need to know uh, how to build that infrastructure. And so we need to provide them with meaningful insight into what the future uh, sea level holds. Um, if you end up building your infrastructure too aggressive, you end up wasting a lot of money. If you end up uh, not building it aggressive enough, you end up losing a lot of infrastructure. So it all boils down to one, one, primarily one thing, and that is glacial flow. One of the largest uncertainties in sea level rise is simply as we change the ocean conditions and as we change the environmental conditions, how will the, the flow of the glaciers change? So that is the most rapid way we can put ice from land into the ocean and it's the, the largest uncertainty. So we could wait and see how things will evolve in the future, that's one option. Or the other option is, is that we go back to the historic record and we try and look at how it's responded in the past. We then learn more about the dynamics of these glaciers, what causes them to change, and then we move on to the, fo the future, we incorporate that knowledge into models that allows us to say something meaningful about what, what might happen uh, in the future. So this is similar to the, the map that Ted showed. This is uh, the, the flow of ice in all of Antarctica. So this is a continent that's, that's larger than continental US. Uh, and all of this ice uh, flows from areas of high elevation where the snow is accumulating, and then it flows out into the ocean. So unlike Greenland, which receives a lot of, of melt and runoff, in Antarctica, uh, about 98% of all of the ice leaves because of just solid ice flowing into the ocean. And so the number one thing in the Antarctic is, is how this is flowing and how it will change into the future. 
So for this sna static snapshot, um, each year about 2,000 cubic kilometers of water leaves the Antarctic ice sheet and enters the ocean. And so tiny perturbations or changes in that amount is what changes the rates of sea level rise. Now, just to go back to kind of the novelty and power of the new sensor, um, I'm looking at the Canadian Arctic, which is uh, maybe not as, uh, as exciting from a glaciological perspective, but it really points to the new capabilities of the satellite. And um, what you'll see here is the velocity scale, the, the, the scale of ice speed on the surface is changed. And all I want to demonstrate with this, uh, this map is that um, we are able to resolve features that are moving um, as slow as 5 to 10 meters per year. And that's just by repeatly, re repeat acquisition of images over top of these surfaces. So the, the, the stability of the instrument is just phenomenal. And to remind you that, that uh, ice sheets have always played a large role in the Earth system, uh, in the middle figure here, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer. Uh, maybe I can point with my mouse here. Um, this middle one to the right, it looks like just a, a it's okay. I think, I think we can move on. Uh, middle right figure here. Oh, okay. We've taken the time to get it, so we may as well use it. Um, this is the Barnes ice cap. This thing is fascinating because it is a dull ice cube sitting uh, on Baffin Island, and it is the remnants of the Laurentide ice sheet. Uh, and so it still lives today uh, in a much smaller extent. And with the new satellite, we're able to uh, measure these subtle flow features that are moving at about 20 meters uh, per year, uh, which is just phenomenal. So now I'm going to move to one last thing here. And I've showed you static maps. And now what I want to show you is how these glaciers are so dynamic. So I'm going to go to a region of High Mountain Asia, which is um, Karakoram Mountain Range. And I'm going to show you some of the glaciers there. And I'm going to show you not just the Landsat 8 record, which we have now, which has far superior um, uh, data capabilities, uh, but I'm also going to include some of the old imagery because as we've gone and we've developed the infrastructure to process the new Landsat 8 imagery, we've also been able to go back in time to generate a, a long record of change. And so I'm going to play this short animation here and um, I want your eyes to adjust. It's going to loop through a couple times, but pick, pick a glacier of your choice, anything that's in this image. And the redder the color, the faster it's flowing. Um, as it moves towards the purple, it's flowing slow. But the first thing you'll see as it loops through each year is that every single glacier shows a very dynamic behavior. And so if you look at the tongues of the glaciers up here in the, um, here, I'll find that pointer again here, um, up in this part of the image as it loops through, you'll see that there's all sorts of what we call um, surging behavior, or binge and purge, where it goes through periods where it's moving quite slow and then quite fast. And this can all seem quite chaotic. And to remove the chaos and try and withdraw or extract um, meaningful understanding from this stuff, we have to look for coherent changes. And uh, that's exactly what Twyla Moon is doing with this data set in uh, Greenland, where she's trying to characterize the glacier changes uh, and try and see how they're responding in similar ways so that we can draw meaningful conclusions from the data set. Did you leave that pointer here? Yes. Uh, hello, I'm at the University of Bristol in the UK thinking about the global value of this data for scientists across the world too. And I first want to reiterate Alex's point that Ice sheets and glaciers together are the largest source of sea level rise, and they are also the source of our largest uncertainty. So we have to understand how they are behaving if we, want, if we have hope of reducing our uncertainties for future projections. Um, I also want to follow on Alex's comments, thinking about the long-term, multiple years of looking at uh, ice flow. So around 2005 through 2009, we did a pretty good job using previous satellites of looking at the Greenland ice sheet once per year. Um, but after 2009, we were the number of areas that we were looking around Greenland declined. And it was not until the launch of Landsat 8 in 2013 that we were again able to look at what's happening around the Greenland ice sheet and actually see all the different areas of it. Um, you can see here uh, the map of the Greenland ice sheet. There are about 240 glaciers around the coast of the Greenland ice sheet that are at least one and a half kilometers wide. Um, so that's 
not small, and there are many of them that you can see here in, in red, and you, I've highlighted just a small region so you can get a sense of the density of these glaciers that are moving ice from the interior of the ice sheet to the ocean. And it's now using um, Landsat 8 data, where here on the right, we have our, our map of velocity. So this is just the general speed that these move. But we can now compare um, from radar images we could get in 2000 looking at ice flow with data that we have from Landsat 8 here in 2016 where we can actually see this change in speed of glaciers. And we can see that of the 165 glaciers that we could measure in 2000, that 58% of those have sped up by at least 20%. Compare that to 12% that have actually slowed. So speed up is a dominant response across the ice sheet of widespread retreat, which we see uh, as a, a response to warming oceans and warming atmospheres around the full ice sheet. Uh, we can also see that the timing of speed up is not the same everywhere. So instead, it's more common for glaciers in the northwest part of the ice sheet to have sped up with increasing speeds since 2006, so they are accelerating their speed up, whereas it's more common for glaciers in the southeast to have sped up around 2006 and have somewhat plateaued their velocity. And it's important that we're seeing these differences in structure so that we can continue to parse out what environmental changes are causing the um, biggest changes or playing the biggest role in glacier motion. Um, I also want to underscore the value that these data have in um, being able to give us a look that is more consistent than once a year, producing true time series of, of ice velocity so that we can look at glacier behavior under a wide range of different conditions. Um, Looking forward towards the future, we are in a position that we can't wait around to observe massive changes happening. We want to be able to use this now at a smaller time scale to actually forecast larger changes before they arrive. Um, so this data set is helping us do that. Previously, um, when we were just looking at the ice sheet once a year, we weren't looking at what was happening under different conditions. But now, because we can actually look at um, velocities every as quickly as every 16 days, we can take a look at what glaciers are doing during the cold winter period like this, where the, there's no hydrology, there's no active melt on the surface. The hydrology system within and underneath the ice sheet has essentially shut down. And we can also look at it during the period where we're seeing melt across the surface of the ice sheet in spring and summer, and we have an active hydrology system on top of, within, and underneath the ice sheet. Um, so. It's, it's these kinds of changes that we were wanting to look at. And by looking at these changes within a year, we can start to see behavior um, that is common to different regions of the, of the ice sheet. So this is velocity over one year, where we can see here um, these areas that I've circled in blue, where glaciers in those areas more commonly show this simple speed up in summer as they're increasing meltwater and then slowing as that meltwater dies off later in the summer, where we have other glaciers further in the south that have this large deceleration in, in late summer. Um, so these are very different behaviors, and being able to see where we have areas of these different behaviors helps us to understand what might change as we see increased meltwater. We know that we're going to be seeing increased meltwater as we continue to have uh, higher air temperatures, and being able to understand this on the seasonal scale is what's helping us to understand what it's going to look like in the future. So um, looking at this kind of behavior where we have this late summer deceleration, I just want to um, zoom in on this movie. So this is just one glacier in southeast, Gla in southeast Greenland. This is Heimdall Glacier. And this, what we're seeing here is actually this seasonal, so sub-monthly changes, where we're seeing in red um, higher velocities. And you can see that it's speeding up here as we're in this spring period, and we're actually here in June seeing the highest, fastest speeds at the end of this glacier. And then we're actually seeing that slowing happening even though we still have surface melt so that we're getting velocity lows that you're seeing in those bluer colors later in the summer.
And it's being able to understand these kinds of reactions to increased meltwater on these short time scales that's helping us to understand what is driving these behavioral changes in glaciers so that we can understand what um, we can expect with future environmental changes without before we actually get there. And I do want to make the point that with this bird's eye view, we're actually able to help people who are going on the ground. We can't have people, um, we don't have time, people, or money to be on the ground everywhere in Greenland, but with this kind of data, we can t very specifically point to the important places that we need to go in order to understand specific processes and really nail down what's going to be happening on these large ice sheets and glaciers in the future. Um, and Mark's going to be talking a bit more about some of these seasonal changes and, and how powerful it is to be able to observe those in Alaska. Hi, I'm Mark Fonstock. I'm from the University of Alaska, the Geophysical Institute in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, and I'm going to follow on from what my colleagues have, have given you, which is a picture of individual glaciers and ice as a whole uh, that, that shows a really rich behavior. And it has a rich behavior on a seasonal time scale. It has these events where year to year glaciers may change speed dramatically. And underneath all of that, given the changes over 15 years, 16 years that Twyla just showed you, there's a regional trend in flow behavior um, that's very clearly putting more ice into the ocean from a place like Greenland than was the case in, in, at the beginning of this century. So Alaska is a place where this sort of noise in glaciers, these surges and these, these seasonal fluctuations of tidewater systems is strongly expressed. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that it snows a lot but melts a lot in Alaska and so water plays a big role. So I'm going to show you some examples. Of, of that. Um, I'm also I'm going to start, though, by just emphasizing, again, even in a state in the US, we are looking at all of the ice flow mapped with this Landsat 8 technique for all of Alaska. That's about 1,000 kilometers in an arc from the Kenai Peninsula down to the southernmost parts, Petersburg, Alaska, down where Leconte Glacier is, which is the southernmost tidewater glacier in, the hem in this hemisphere. It's down in that part of the image. And uh, in this data set, um, we, we, we have this map of what all these glaciers are doing, and so we get a different view than a tourist would get who was on a cruise ship who, where's my pointer? Ah, we do steal each other's tools. Um, the, you know, if you're on a cruise ship, you come in and you look at the front of Hubbard Glacier, um, you dock over here, you get on the train in Anchorage, and you might see a glacier or two in Denali as you go by. And that gives you a span of slower interior glaciers and really interesting tidewater behavior, but you miss some other things. And so this is, this is actually not quite the cruise ship view of Hubbard Glacier. This is a glacier that's going eight meters a day over here. It's going one meter a day over here. But this part over here has a swing in speed from, from eight meters or 10 meters a day during the fast parts that Twyla was showing you in that velocity curve to almost two meters a day or even occasionally nearly stopping in late summer. And that's a really interesting behavior. You can't see it when you just look at the glacier. Um, and we, we're also going to talk about surges, glaciers that speed up and slow down and their surfaces get really crevassed. And over that thousand mile long swath of glaciers, you can have huge glaciers have major changes. And if a pilot doesn't happen to note it and mention it to somebody, no one may know that this actually happened. These are really remote and very large systems. So we're going to, we're going to look back here in the St. Elias Mountains. Um, actually, most of this is in the Yukon. These glaciers are flowing north off the range here. Um, they're they're uh, looking very noisy in this data because we're only going to look at 35-day chunks. I'm just taking all of the pixels that were accumulated by Landsat over a tenth of a year. Um, that's a little easier than months for me. But there's going to be a glacier right here you can barely see because in this short chunk there was a lot of cloud and so it didn't really work a lot. Um, that's one thing. Glaciers happen in the mountains and they're there because it snows a lot. And so clouds are always a challenge in optical data. But we're going to see this glacier change dramatically over three years. We're going to see this glacier down here change dramatically. There's one up here that also changes. And what I'm going to do, what you'll see here, is just a looped animation that shows you the speed. And this is the Steel Glacier. And that is a speed up from nearly stationary to about five meters per day. And that propagates down the whole length of the glacier. This is a classic glacier surge. There's one on an even bigger system here, the Walsh, where 30 or 40 kilometers of the upper part of that glacier speed up. And then that surge front propagates all the way down to here. And in 2016, at the end of that, that, that surge front is just crossing the international border, and it's about to export some ice from Canada to the US. 
Um, that surge front is also 100 meters high. It's like 300 feet high. And the ice behind it is, is moving about the width of this room a day, maybe 15 meters or so um, per day. So these are the active surges that we can image in the, in the middle of this year on the Steel, the Klutlan, and the Walsh Glacier. There's a few other surges going on. But when I was in grad school, to go back three decades, we knew about surging glaciers only because pilots reported them, or the first time a surging glacier got studied in detail, scientists from University of Alaska and, and University of, of Washington went every year for 15 years and put down stakes and surveyed those stakes and saw how much the thickness had changed and how fast the glacier was moving. And at the end of that, there was a big surge of variegated glacier that got big attention and, and really interesting photos. But if they hadn't watched the progression of that surge cycle, we wouldn't know what was going on. Now, you have to step back and think about the real problem here, which is what about the, the land-based ice on Earth that's flowing into the ocean is likely to change in the future? That's really the question. At what, at, how much will the rates of ice flowing off the land into the ocean change? On top of that, we have all sorts of very interesting flow behaviors. Surges are one way that glaciers along this particular mountain range and a number of other places around the world get a lot of mass from upper elevations to lower elevations where it will melt and then run off in rivers. Um, seasonal variation in velocity complicates, it's really interesting, it tells you how water influences ice flow, but it complicates the challenge of measuring how this stuff is going to trend in the future. And so where we sit right now is that we've entered an era where instead of a pilot telling us a glacier is changing, or instead of a field party recognizing a change in one of the 242 glaciers of the size that Twyla is following, we are actually following sort of on a month-by-month -month basis with Landsat 8, we are able to just process all of the imagery that comes in and develop velocity fields. And we now are watching all the outlet glaciers on Earth change in near real time. And as a set of scientists, not just us sitting here, but as a field, people have struggled with this problem and worked on this problem. And we're not unique in solving it. We've just processed this entire data set in a uniform way. And we think we will be able to keep up with it in real time. And we are releasing all of these are Landsat frames over all the, the ice on Earth. And the suite of data processed for Landsat 8 is, is being released this week at NSIDC today. I think it's live. You could actually go FTP it. But it allows you to go in in any place on Earth that has a decent sized outlet glacier and follow what it's doing. And we hope follow it into the future. So we're entering an era where our eyes are open, where we are not going to be surprised by changing ice flow and where the variability in ice flow that we can measure now can help us to understand the physics that drives that variability. It's that physics, the stuff that goes on against the ocean and underneath the ice and the role water plays and the role sediment plays at the bed. That physics that drives that variability is also the physics that's going to constrain the response of the land-based ice on Earth going forward. And so being able to watch it in real time is going to help us quite a bit in anticipating how that physics will influence this, this equation, you know, is the ice on land or is it increased sea level as we go forward? Thank you. Okay, so now we'll open up to questions from reporters in the room. Uh, Horst Rademacher, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung in Germany. Um, just a quick question, and I'm sorry, I may have missed it at the beginning. Uh, conceptually, are you using optical imagery from Landsat 8, or are you? I saw some of the uh, slides had radar imagery, or had at least. Uh, Landsat 8 is an optical satellite. Okay. We're using the panchromatic band, which is 15 meter pixels, mm -hmm. and it has 12 bit uh, radiometric resolution. If you're aware of that term, it's uh, basically its ability to discriminate grayscale levels. It's uh, so I believe it's uh, ask 32 times as good as uh, Landsat 7. OK, so a follow-up as optical. Um, so you showed us pictures from the northern winter or the southern uh, winter. Um, how do you get the pictures, and what do you do on, yeah. on cloudy days? I mean, there are quite a few in Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, well, uh, so I get, I'll, I'll handle that. So um, this, this very much is a record that, that is in addition to the imaging radars of the world that are imaging and tracking motion. 
um, the, the amount of imagery that you can take, the, the, that, that an optical satellite can take is significantly larger than you can usually image with, with a radar satellite, although that is improving. It's just, it's just bandwidth limited um, and energy limited on, on orbit for these satellites. But the, the thing that really changed, so, so Landsat 8 is much better at seeing surface texture of bright surfaces. That's, that's a big deal. But the other thing is that the satellite itself is quite capable of taking almost every single image over land surfaces every day. And so that, that, that's not, the predecessors to it couldn't do that. And so the cloud cover issue is not as bad for Landsat 8 just because you image more frequently. We don't see every 16 days in a, in a cloudy area. We see, but we see the surface, every one of these glaciers in Alaska, we see between 20 and 60 times a year we were able to make a velocity map. And, and so optical data has become practical for doing this, and optical data is fairly easy to process in large scale, and that's allowed us to produce this record. It's supplemental to the radar record. I, I do just wanna, just wanna clarify that um, all of these images that you saw are all from optical data. Um, the only radar data used in any of the images that we've put up here are that differencing between 2000, which was a radar um, derived velocity in 2006, but all of this is, is being produced out of optical now. Okay, next. Uh, hi, it's Jonathan Amos from the BBC, kind of related to that, do you, do you plan to incorporate the European Landsat system, Sentinel-2? Um, because, I mean, that system was designed to be complementary with Landsat, um, and that would greatly improve your repeat and hopefully see through those, those patches of, of clear so, cloud. So the funding was intended to support Landsat 8 analysis, and uh, we've been funded for about a year, actually started working on it shortly after we submitted the proposal. I think in the coming years, yes, we definitely will begin to integrate the Sentinel-2 data and uh, uh, cover the Earth more frequently. There are other groups that are also have already begun to put some of the Sentinel-2-derived uh, products online for limited areas around the world. But Sentinel-2 is clearly a great satellite as well, has a wider swath, and will get even more frequent coverage. And uh, I think it's been alluded to that uh, that's going to help with the cloud cover. It doesn't help with the daylight, but it does help with the cloud cover. Um, and in fact, because we deal often at high latitude, we can kind of get that darkness season fairly short with Landsat 8. Yeah, I might add, so the, but we are, we are beginning to think about incorporating Sentinel-2 um, at pending funding and resources, obviously, mostly storage, um, but the, the, it looks very promising. This question of what we do during the polar night um, is a very good one. One thing that we do have during the polar night um, is, is that we can bridge it. We can see how much the ice moved during that time. And so you get an average speed across the, the, the polar night, and you can know whether or not there was a very large speed up or a very large slowdown just from that. We also, uh, you know, at, at the latitudes, it's, it's 60, 62 degrees in Alaska, that polar night's quite short. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, because the satellite image is around noon, so it, you, you do pick up the sun as soon as it comes back up. Okay, any other questions or reporters in the room? I'm Ned Roselle. I write for Alaska newspapers via the Geophysical Institute where Mark works at. Um, I was just wondering uh, some details on Landsat 8. Three questions. Who launched it? How high does it orbit above the Earth? And how long will it last? It sounds want? like it should have been the first slide, shouldn't it? Doesn't yeah. It? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, NASA built and launched Landsat 8. Uh, USGS manages the satellite. I believe the orbit is around 700 kilometers. Uh, it's in a sun-synchronous orbit. Um, it repeats the track exactly. Now, let me come back to that exactly part in a bit. Uh, every 16 days. And um, there have been Landsats in orbit and in very similar orbits to the one that Landsat 8 is in uh, f since the early 1980s. Before that, it was a slightly different orbit and a much different sensor. Uh, still, there's even evidence or, or data available going back to the 70s that with a lot of work can be used. Exactly repeating 
is one advantage of Landsat 8 that we didn't dwell on. Um, the images are so well geolocated with this satellite as opposed to Landsat 7, uh, 5, or 4 that you have almost perfect overlap. Features that aren't moving are in the same uh, location in the pairs of images that we use. So we start from a much better perspective of what's moving, what didn't move. There are still some adjustments to be made to get the best, most accurate data, but we get a huge leg up by having nearly exact uh, geolocation, nearly exact positioning of the pixels on the ground without having to do anything to the data that comes out of USGS. They've done a remarkable job and it's really empowered this whole processing that we do rapidly. Do you know the design lifetime? Uh, actually, Landsat 8 is, uh, I think, designed for five years, but Landsat 7 has survived for, uh, I believe, we're exactly. 16. Yeah. Quite, yeah, quite yeah, frequently, 16 the years. Landsat satellites have, have operated many years past their design lifetimes, yeah. and I, I think maybe pertinent to that is that Landsat 9 is scheduled to be launched in 20, 2020. 2020. Ted is on the Landsat science team, so he's an advisor to that effort. Um, but. Oh, for Landsat 8, it was launched in February of 2013. Data came online around May and June of 2013. Um, to dwell on the satellite a little bit, almost everything about the satellite is operating fantastically. The thermal channel, which was built, uh, sort of added on late and built on a lower budget, has had a few issues. On the optical side, uh, it's done a phenomenal job. and. To its credit, far more aspects of research and land use are making use of Landsat 8 uh, than just glaciology. Well, it's, it's been a transformational satellite for a lot of different fields. Rick Lovett, Freelance. Um, I'm over here. Um, uh, so my question is, you said almost exactly um, overlap and you made it sound like pixel by pixel in the same place? Can you, what's, what's the tolerance on this? So, well, the, the, the Design tolerance, I think, is that, that pixels be 50 meters, the geolocation knowledge be about 50 meters. We, we do have to shift the images a tiny bit to get them to line up with each other, um, but usually the internal geometry of the image is so good that we can, we can shift the images, just, just take the two images and shift them a tiny, tiny bit. Um, and that's why you can measure very low speeds with these satellites is that once you take all the rock or the very slow moving areas of the scene, and you shift them by a tiny bit, you, you end up with, with a geometry where when the pixels aren't in the right place, it's only motion that you're tracking. And so that makes the signal really good. Alex has a more sophisticated look at that. He basically looks through the entire stack of all Landsat that was imaged in an area and, and uses the landscape to tell him where, where the registration of images is best by how they appear in a whole bunch of images. You might want to talk to him about that detail of it. Um, but it's, it is the fact that, that for Cryosat 2 as well, or sorry, Cryosat 2, <laughs> Sentinel 2, um, the, it, it is the fact that satellites are just better than they used to be. They, they, the ability to point a satellite at a known location on Earth and understand after the fact that that, that pixel is actually located right where it is, uh, it, we see it on Google Earth every day. When they drop imagery into Google Earth, the parking lot's in exactly the right place. These are, you know, th this isn't the 1970s anymore. It's so, you, so, so, right. so you're talking meters here. Um, the, yeah, the, the, it, it, it really comes down to how well known the elevation field of the Earth was that they used to put all the pixels in the right place. When they, when they take a Landsat scene and turn it into a map view, but the, the effects depend on, on how good the elevation models are and the elevation models of the Earth are improving all the time. I, I just wanted to say one thing that, that I don't know if this is on, um, that, that may have escaped the people in this room, and that is is that um, Landsat 8 is imaging at uh, pixel resolution. So the imagery we look at is, is 15 meters on the ground, and we're resolving velocities at five meters per year. So the question is, is well, you know, a full pixel movement would be 15 meters. Um, but what we have is we have techniques and we have such sophistication uh, in the instrument itself, that we don't have to see a whole pixel move. We can see a pixel move just slightly, and that allows us to map velocity fields at much higher resolution and the changes in resolution um, than is actually being acquired in the native imagery that we're extracting it from. 
Yeah, that's that's kind of a complex concept. It's because we use patches of pixels and a mathematical routine that that looks for the best correlation, and then we fit. Once we get close, uh, the code that Mark and Alex have written uh, actually interpolates to a, a, a fraction of a pixel. And to get a simple answer to your question about geolocation, the area of a pixel is 15 meters. The geolocation turns out to be less than the size of a pixel. So you know, you, you can stack pixels and get a pretty good idea. We still do some shifting, but because we get so close to start off with, it's much easier to deal with Landsat 8 than Landsat 7 was. Any more questions from reporters in the room? We have questions from the web chat. We have a question from Casey Deemer at Live Science. This question is for Ted Scambos. Casey asks, what exactly does the ice's skin texture tell us about its changes? Now that's interesting, but that's a different, <laughs> that's a different result from Landsat 8. Um, uh, it looks like Landsat 8 because it tracks that texture and because that texture has an amplitude can be used to map the surface roughness, both crevasses and snow dunes, those sastrugi is the word that's used uh, for those windswept dunes that you saw in a couple of pictures. And um, it's an interesting additional application of Landsat 8, probably relates to uh, climate and weather over a place like Antarctica or Greenland. Um, and that's, that's really for another time. But surface roughness is another uh, opportunity for uh, tracking climate with landscape, surface roughness of ice sheets. OK. Are there any more questions from the web chat? No. Any other questions from reporters in the room? Yep. Hi there. Uh, Jeff Tollefson with Nature. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail about what was possible with Landsat 7 and some of the earlier ones? I mean, was this ever attempted? Um, could you get close, but we didn't have good results? Um, and then perhaps also the, the radar as well. Um, so you know. so I'll, I'll speak specifically to the, to the Landsat record. Um, the approaches that we're applying have been applied since the early 1990s. Um, what's changed is kind of a big data approach. So. Um, for, for the, some of the data we're, we're showing here, we're, we're processing about a half a petabyte of data um, in, in the archive of just data collected over, over ice. And um, the approaches that were being applied previously would, you know, you would take an image and you would try and get a velocity field out of it and you would, you would get bothered by cloud and you'd get bothered by the uncertainty in the instrument. But as we move to kind of a big data approach, um, we can tolerate a lot of noise because what we do is we, we have a, a noisy signal a lot of times, which gives us a clean signal as we start to stack everything up. So the Landsat, the early Landsat record wasn't utilized as heavily as we are now, uh, partly because all of that uh, data wasn't even available online. Uh, the, the demand for the older imagery is going up as we learn how to use it, and now that we have the computational resources to extract the signal. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, uh, artifacts uh, just because we've learned how to build these instruments better over time. So uh, the early imagery, uh, it would saturate out over um, the interiors of the ice sheet or in winter, so you would have nothing. There would be no future to track to. So um, all you would get was, would be the edges of the ice sheet. Um, and then uh, with Landsat 7, unfortunately, uh, I think it's two years after launch, three years after launch, um, we had some problems where we, we have striping in the imagery. And so uh, a lot of people just didn't deal with that. Um, and we've now come up with clever new ways that we don't care about the holes in the data. Uh, we can tolerate that and we can generate these long, coherent records, uh, which is really being driven by the, the big investment in the Landsat 8 processing that we've now realized gives us a, a full and complete record, starting uh, often in 1985, depending on where the images have been acquired. So, um, go, go ahead. Oh, um, well, do you want to mention optical? I was going to move to radar. Uh, let me, well, let me just say one quick thing about what's changed between the instruments is simply, so Landsat has to make a design choice. They need to be able to image really dark water and really dark land surfaces, as well as very bright white surfaces. And effectively, the dynamic range in the imager on Landsat 8 is, is uh, it, it has a much higher top end, so it doesn't saturate over really bright surfaces when it can still image dark surfaces. 
and it's also got a radiometric resolution that's about a factor of 16 better. So it can show you the difference between two really bright pixels that vary by a little tiny bit. And so those two things are what have, have enabled the large area coverage. In Landsat 7, you could only see the contrast of crevasses. And you know where the ice is going fast, it breaks up, and then you can track those features. And Landsat 8 moved that into other areas. Um, and you had asked briefly about a radar. And so just I'll put that in perspective using the Greenland ice sheet as an example, since I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, but really, just thinking about both radar and optical satellites that we've had up and been able to process surface velocities from, really I want to mention that none of them have had measuring ice velocity as one of their primary mission um, directives. So it's something that is kind of catch as catch can. And in, case, in the case of the Greenland ice sheet, we um, had a nice winter map that was fairly comprehensive in the winter of 2000, 2001, and then not again until the winter of 2005 to 2006, and then annually, as I mentioned, up to the um, 2009. And those were coming from a variety of um, most primarily Canadian radar sat. Um, and then those really dropped off, and uh, the replacement temporarily was uh, limited data footprints from uh, mostly the German Terrace RX satellite. And there we covered about 54 glaciers, primarily in the northwest and the southeast, and had measurements ranging from three to six measurements per year for most glaciers. A couple, um, many of you may have heard of Jakobshavn Glacier on the west coast, had more regular sampling. But for the most part, um, during that 2009 to 2013 period, we really had a very big hole in being able to see what was happening on the ice sheet. And a lot of that um, earlier interest in just looking once a year was because we didn't have any sense of how dramatically things could happen um, and, and how much change could happen over the course of seasons. But with the launch of satellites, um, where we're actually able to see, with, as we can with Landsat 8, these very in, in intense changes over short time periods, um, we're getting a dramatically different look at, at what is happening on glaciers and ice sheets. Uh, um, unfortunately, it is only a few years, but I sometimes say I don't look at a couple glaciers for several hundred years. I look at several hundred glaciers for a couple years, and you can see a lot that's happening. I, I would, so to, to put the radar and the, the optical imagery in context, so it, Alex referenced 1992. That's actually when Ted took a couple of Landsat images of the ice streams that he showed and, and made a large area map. Prior to that, measurements were made in very difficult ways pre-GPS on the ground, trying to figure out the speed in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's quite a bit like sitting in the middle of Illinois and, and it's just completely flat and featureless in many directions and, and you're trying to figure out what's moving. Um, but it really saw a revolutionized, imaging radar revolutionized what we knew. It was the first time that the velocity fields of entire ice sheets was measured. And those, uh, one of the first of those is that is the 2000 mosaic that Ian Jockin put together with radar set imagery. It's the, the the limitation had been there that those SARS had operational constraints. They had they had they had missions far different than ice sheets, and so the data availability was quite limited. Um, and so it that has improved in recent years for SAR, just in the last few years, um, and it also has improved very dramatically for optical imagery. And so I think we will come to see velocity histories that are rich, that come not just from Landsat, but also from Im imaging radars uh, going forward. But we've gone from a situation where we didn't have a velocity map for a whole ice sheet till in 2000 we did, and both ice sheets really in, a, in about the same time period, to now we are looking at all of the outlet glaciers essentially all the time, and that means we think about it differently for research. We don't have to be responsive to change. We can observe it happening. Um, and SAR will play a very large role in that as well going forward, as will other optical sensors. There's nothing unique about this process that, that we can't incorporate other data and other groups are doing very similar things. Um, it's just that, it's just this concept of we, we have our eyes open now and we're able to follow what the Earth's land-based ice cover is doing. Um, and it has a lot to teach us, I think. Okay, I think we have one more question from the web chat, and that'll be all we have time for. Another question from Casey Deaver at Lab Science. Casey asks, in launching these flow maps publicly, what do you hope to achieve in terms of help from citizen scientists, public knowledge, and collaboration with other efforts? 
Yeah. Hmm. Uh, you I'm optimistic that um, it's really going to launch a thousand ships, basically, in terms of investigations of glaciers all over the world. There's just so much science that we've already seen. Um, needs a lot more work to get it into publishable form, but we found so much uh, out about um, what's going on with the world's ice just from the processing that we've done so far. In terms of citizen science, I think they're going to be able to check for themselves, check on their favorite glacier, take a look at uh, whether or not um, they're interested in the subject of glaciology. In terms of telling us when there's a surge or a change in the ice front, that already happens at NSIDC with other imagery that we produce. Um, but I'm sure it'll happen more frequently now, and we welcome that. It's great to hear that the public's interested and that they found something that we didn't see. But um, moreover, it's, it's pretty clear that this is mostly a boon to the research community, less so perhaps to the policy or decision-making community, but as a knock-on effect from better understanding of glaciers. And uh, moreover, by presenting the data easily in an easy format to use and look at, it makes it clear that there's no, that it's obvious what's going on in the world's ice and, and, in, and that the world is changing and that uh, there's no uh, uh, attempt to hide it at all. So um, yeah, it's, it, it makes it plain as day that, that we have a changing earth. So from the perspective of researchers, uh, other than sitting up here at the table, I think uh, you have a three and a half year context of how the glacier you're studying flows and how it varies. And you can also know before you fly in to work on one of these glaciers what it's doing this year. And I think in that context, you can ask different questions. And so you, so you, you, you will, you know, for lack of a better term, you have situational awareness. When you go in to study a glacier, you know what it does. You, you, you will ask different questions. You'll put your instruments in different places. So we hope it, in, it helps people uh, more aggressively pursue field measurement campaigns because they've got better information up front. I, that's actually all we have time for right now, but you guys can feel free to talk to the participants afterwards. So we're going to take a break for lunch, and our next press conference will be at 1.30.